Good morning, everybody. Find your seats. We'll, uh, we'll get going this morning. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I hope you had a great, great week and uh, be nice to get into the word of the Lord and hear what he has to say for us. But before we get going, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We, we praise your name, uh, the, the God that is amazing, uh, providing a way for us for salvation, uh, a way to heaven, a way to be able to live our lives here on this earth and be able to shine our light for you. Lord, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. Go before us this morning and uh, give us your wisdom and understanding and grace. We just thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. How many people are golfers here? Any golfers? We got, we, got, we got one or two? Used to be? Well, I've golfed in a lot of charity golf tournaments over the years, and, uh, you know, you, they're fun events. You can, you can get around and, you know, you play a format called best ball, where all four of you tee off, and you take the best drive. That's the, the, the way that they do it. And sometimes, though, no one gets a good drive. No one gets a good drive. And so what happens is prior to the tournament, usually you can buy these things called mulligans. You know what a mulligan is? Mulligan is when you, you know, take your tee shot, slice it off into no man's land, which I have been known to do a few times. <laughs> I've done that a number of times. Um, and so... I wanted to let you know that I need to take a mulligan for last week's lesson. Um, I, I just, you know, I got off into a, 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 the world system and, and covered a lot of things. And what happens with that sometimes, in, in this case, is that I got off from the meaning of the text. Right? I got off from the meaning of the text. And when that happens, right, it's, there's confusion and could cause misunderstandings. Now, this wasn't intentional, obviously, but, you know, it's, it's a little discouraging for someone like me that obviously you spend all that time studying and trying to go through it and you're trying to be accurate. And then when you're not accurate, you know, it's a little discouraging and it's, it's hard to swallow, but it is reality and what happened. And I wanted to apologize to you and you know, ask for your forgiveness for that. Um, and I'll try to connect the dots a little bit better today so we can uh, actually learn what the passage has to teach because it is pretty amazing. It's kind of like the Matrix, right? You ever seen that little pen that they have and you just, you just hit that pen and you forget everything from last week? Well, that's kind of what uh, I would hope that would happen. <laughs> Not that the information was all bad, and I think we can all understand and agree that the world has its definite evils. The, the, the world, um, the motive behind a lot of the system can be dark. I mean, we know that Satan is the ruler. Um, as we talked about last week, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one is what we uh, talked a little bit about. But however, we need to strike a balance with this. We need to strike a balance because everything isn't evil in this world. Objects and systems and uh, these kinds of uh, things are not evil in and of themselves, are they? Um, when it becomes evil is by our choices. When our choices draw us in to our fleshly desires and our actions uh, that are sinful, uh, when we do those things, our choices, it shows us in a way that we are loving the world. When we follow after that, our choices that we face every day, it really shows our allegiance. You know, we can make good choices, we can make them well, and we can also make sinful choices. We have that ability to do that. And that's what John is referring to here in, in verse 15, that we are not to have any unhealthy desires or appetites uh, for the things of this world. Because there's nothing wrong with owning a car. There's nothing wrong with having a nice house and uh, enjoying a good meal. Um, nothing wrong with those things. I mean, prescription drugs in and of themselves are not evil. But 
when a person is drawn away by their own lusts uh, into using those in the wrong way, it is in a way showing that they do love the world system. The internet has made life easy. It's easy for, to prepare messages. It's easy to research, find information. But when those Google searches turn into corrupt uh, searches, it is a way of showing uh, a love for this world. And it's not something that we should be drawn into. Anything, really, that pulls us away from the Lord by the lust of the flesh is loving something other than the Lord. So let's read our text again. We're going to cover 1 John 2, 15 to 17 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Now, if you look at that, those three verses, you're going to see that John lays out three reasons why we are not to love the world. The first one in verse 15, it says, it reveals that the love of the Father is not in you. That's the first one. Second one is found in verse 16. It says, all that is in the world is not from the Father. And the third one is, because the world is passing away. Our affections, our desires should not be focused here because the world is passing away. This cosmos is passing away. And you have to wonder, you, know, you look at that, do not love the world. Where does this sinful uh, system and people behind it started? It started with the sin of Adam. Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. That started the whole process. In the beginning, it was good. There was no sin. Corruption entered in, and then sinful people come in and corrupt that system, and it started there. But how do we as Christians live in a fallen world and still glorify the Lord? That's, that's the question. How, how are we in this system, in this world, and still glorify the Lord? How do we not love the things of this world? How do we not love the things of this world? Any thoughts? Oh, <laughs> it's so obvious. <laughs> love the things of the Lord more, and yeah, you won't love the things that are in this world. And I think that's, that's really uh, an astute way to look at it. I think it's don't be drawn in to sin by our fleshly lusts. That sin that corrupts us, Adam's sin, in our own bodies, it has corrupted us. And thankfully, the Lord, when he entered in, uh, saved us. But we're still tainted, aren't we? Yes. Right. Right. We, we are not loving the world. Um, how do we as Christians not live in this fallen world? I mean, your comment is, is important because it's, there's an order. Love God, <laughs> right, is what you're saying. Put an emphasis on that because uh, all things in the world aren't bad. Is that, you, is that kind of what? Yeah, those are created. Those are created in him. Right. I like that. I'm trying to see if I can repeat it exactly. <laughs> Just an order. There's an order. God created that order. We put more emphasis on him than we do the created things. I think that's what it comes down to. The system that we live in, it can enslave and it does enslave the unregenerate. 
We, we can see how it impacts their lives in a, in a way, but it also creates friction for believers as well. It creates friction for believers. Every one of us, I mean, we have to make decisions every day. We live here, we fight the flesh to conform to, the, to God's image. The good and the bad are all around us, no matter what we do. And so there's that friction comes in to play uh, and those worldly influences around us. It's not an accident. Much of everything we witness is heavily influenced by the people that are following after the, the spirit um, of the evil one. That's what we see. And it seems that the forces of darkness are always there providing us opportunities. Always providing us opportunities for decisions that run contrary to the will of God. Ever been to Vegas? Sensory overload? That's what happens. It's all around us. We would do well to heed the words of James where he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what we're supposed to do as believers. Resist him and he will flee from you. When the world really parades its fleshly desires uh, before us, we should be ready to honor God with our choices. We flee from the devil when we are not drawn into his schemes. Again, from James, we read, we're to keep ourselves unstained from the world. To live unstained is just not to have the mud uh, all over the world, uh, of the world all over us. We're to be unstained by it. We're to remain spotless from the effects of this world. That's what uh, James is talking about. It's true that there are evil motives, desires all over the place, but we can't forget that all, God also has a love for this world, doesn't he? First, or, uh, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. All is not lost for those that don't believe. But the time isn't always going to be on your side if you don't believe. I mean, the Lord is certainly gracious and allowing space for people to consider the gospel. There's no doubt about that. Um, giving them space to repent from their sins and to trust him. Second Peter lays it out pretty well. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some consider slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The world is not our home. It's not our home. We're looking toward eternity. Um, much of what I see in John, I just want to draw, draw your attention to something that is in the book of 1 John, and it's also in the book of Revelation. Um, John was written between 80, 90, and 95, somewhere in that range, and the book of Revelation was written in 80, 95. So it's, they're, they're pretty close in time frame. Uh, these, these tests that John is talking about, we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about those. The tests in 1 John are part of the structure we have been working through in this. He's talking to the church. He's addressing the Gnostic false teaching, but he's also talking about true and false believers in the church and how to identify those. The tests have been laid out by John. In verse, chapter 1, verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. In 1.8, he says, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In 1.10, he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And in verses, or chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, in this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Chapter 2, verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God has been perfected. Chapter 2, verse 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. And what I find interesting, that in chapter 2 of Revelation, those in Ephesus were commended for their steadfastness in testing those that said they were apostles, but actually weren't. They carried that knowledge that John is teaching here over into uh, later writings. Uh, I, th I think about the testing of their faith. Uh, 
It's for the whole church. I mean, John is writing, if you look back a few verses in chapter 2, he's writing to fathers, he's writing to young men, he's writing to children. This is a message for the entire church uh, in any age. It doesn't matter what it is, that we are to test those that say they are in the faith because it either proves that your authenticity by the actions and the choices that you make or it proves that you are an imposter by the actions and choices that you make. That's the the point of it all. But now John brings us to the test of love. This is the command here. Do not love the things in this world, right? The other ones are examples. And uh, in that, this is a command uh, that he says, do not love the world. What we love tends to define us, doesn't it? What we love defines us. It says that Demas loved this present age in 2 Timothy 4.10. He deserted Paul and the cause of Christ to follow after something else that is never going to fulfill his needs. But you know what? The world didn't make him do that. Demas left under his own accord. What was in his heart moved him to leave the very apostle Paul to seek something other. And that's hard to understand, but that's what sin does. So in verse 16 of our uh, lesson this morning, it says, when John says, do not love the things in this world uh, or the things that draw us into the world's ways, he's mentioning the things that are in this world. It is the lust of the flesh, Lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. If you let those things control you to focus on those things in a, in a, in a wrong fashion, then we shouldn't be doing that. What's the first thing that pops into your head when you hear that phrase, lust of the flesh? What's the first thing that pops into your head? What is it? Peter, pornography, Pornography. a negative sexual desire, addiction, sins, sins of any kind of addiction. That's kind of what plays in my mind. I think these are more of the sensual uh, sins that John is talking about. It could encompass more, but I think there's an emphasis on that here for sure, So, lust of the flesh, uh, it's the negative sexual desires, pornography, things that are in there. What is lust? What is lust? Strong desire. desire. It's an unhealthy uh, desire. It's a longing for something uh, that you have. The longing for something that satisfies the body. But those could be good and they, those could be evil, right? There could be either or. But in this case, we're talking about the things that are negative. Things that are negative. Lust of the flesh, uh, carnal appetites. Those are negative attributes. What is the flesh? What is the flesh? No one ever said, hey, minister to the Lord in the flesh. Can't be good. What is the flesh? Physical rather than spiritual. Physical rather than spiritual so just our bodies? Is that what we're talking about here? It's our sin nature. Exactly. It represents man's sin nature, our fleshly desires that run contrary to the Lord. That's, that's the flesh. Um, and we know lust isn't always negative, is it? It's the object of that lust that is negative, can be negative. And the choices that lead us to make those uh, can be ungodly. Where does lust come from? It comes from sin, from Satan? comes from within a person. 
by our sinful desires and passions that are within inside of us, doesn't it? The inner desires, those cravings that are within, uh, that's the flesh. It's inherent in, a, in every fabric of our being, isn't it? And that's why we have friction. That's why we try to fight it all the time and why we want to be around uh, the Word of God at all times because there's that friction there. Paul tells us in Romans 7, 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh for the willing in, is present in me but the working out of the good is not. Nothing in the flesh that is good and desirable. And I think we see that in Galatians, because the objects themselves, like I said, aren't necessarily good or bad. It's the choices and, and the things that we decide to do. That's why I think in Galatians it says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. The things that we do that are run contrary to the Lord are evident, he says in Galatians. And these are immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You practice those deeds, those are the ones that are going to lead you astray. You make those choices to follow those things in this worldly system because Romans 8, 6 says this, the mind set on the flesh is death. Can't be good. You focus on those things, it leads to death and destruction and all kinds of problems with relationships and everything else. But on the flip side, there's the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things as these, there isn't even a law against those. No one can come against you for that. And Romans 8, 6 says, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Completely different. One side is death, the other side is life and peace. Isn't that amazing? We're not to put any confidence in the flesh because it leads to all kinds of sin, but the life in the Spirit produces a healthy fruit. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Yahweh, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength. Makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from Yahweh. We're not to put any confidence in the flesh. Zero. Our confidence should be in the Lord as a believer. And when we are in the flesh, we are being drawn away from the strength of God. We're being taken away from him, instead of operating uh, under his power, we focus ourselves uh, on our own self-reliance, not trusting God for everything. Uh, it is living under our own power instead of God's power. Flesh and living leads to brokenness and destruction, and that's not where we want to be. Then John brings it down to the next, uh, next one there in, in verse 16, uh, Lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes is different because lust of the flesh is internal. It's that fleshly desire that's inherent in us and, and the choices that we make. But lust of the eyes is different. Uh, it's, it's external, isn't it? It's the things that we see uh, and focus on, whether it's TV, movies, uh, billboards, um, Anything that draws our eye into that thinking that could lead us astray. I think it's true that uh, the song that you learn as a little kid is accurate, accurate. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's true, isn't it? There are many things that we all probably wish we could unsee because they draw us away from the Lord himself. I like how Matthew puts it. He says the eye, of the, the eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is the lamp of the body so that in your eye, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, 
How great is that darkness? Wow. It's the lamp of the body. That's amazing to me. We have examples in Scripture of what those lustful actions uh, of the eye, when acted upon, uh, it just creates destruction if, it, if it's used in the wrong way. And we see that in Joshua chapter 7 with Achan. He saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. He says, then I coveted them and took them and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent. He had to pay the price for those actions because he saw something, he coveted it, he took it and it was sinful. And here's what happened. And all Israel stoned him with stones. Not just him. They burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Did this just happen to him? No. It says that they took him, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him. And they burned them. Right? Not just that. They also uh, created a headstone, or a, a created a great heap of stones that stand to this day. And Yahweh turned from his burning anger. So they created a monument, said, don't ever do what Achan did. Lust of the eyes can lead to destructive behaviors. We saw it with David. When kings went out to war, what did David do? He's walking on the top of his building. He sees a beautiful woman. He sends people to go get her. He has relations with her. She becomes pregnant. And you know the story beyond that. Those eyes create a desire within people and when acted upon in that negative fashion can lead to destruction and sin. It's the same thing all the time if we do that. Solomon with all his wealth said this, Ecclesiastes 2.10, all that my eyes asked for, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any gladness, for my heart was glad because of my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Now I point that verse out simply for this, we have to have restraint. We can't just allow uh, our eyes to take in everything that we want. Because as we know uh, from Solomon and the examples, that everything that he took in was not healthy and it was not good. The last thing is the boastful pride of life in that uh, chapter, or verse 16 there. How does the boastful pride of life draw someone into the ways of the world? How does the boastful pride of life draw someone into the ways of the world? How does it do that? Yeah. By wanting to get approval from other people in the world. Right, exactly. When you want to get approval from people in the world, it's, it's a way of being drawn into that system because you're glorifying yourself instead of glorifying the Lord. Is, did I, is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. What else? How are, how are other ways that people can be drawn in? Right, people have their own self-righteousness, they just can't hear. Is that, yeah, that's true. What else? How else are we drawn in by the boastful pride of life? I think, yeah. I think sometimes we see things that, uh, that are advertised uh, in the world that make people think they're going to be prettier, smarter, more well-loved. Right. And you see those things on billboards, on TV, and, you know, in newspapers, magazines, whatever. And we feel like we have to be that way, like Karen said, to, to have the approval of people. 
right? We see all these things out there that show beautiful people and, you know, beautiful clothes, and we have to have all those things, and it is a sense of pride, and definitely for that it's true. Yeah, I think it's, it, boastful pride, I think, just draws people into the ways of the world because it's, it feeds the flesh. It really does. It feeds our desire uh, for self, for look at me, look at who I am, and look at what I can do. Um, it seeks the praise of men, like, like Kieran said. Uh, it, it, it is self who is in the spotlight. That's the problem. When self is in the spotlight, it's kind of like the stars on the red carpet. You have them, all the spotlights are on them. They're the ones that are getting all the accolades. They are the center of attention. That kind of attention can be addicting. It's like a drug, I think. They, they want to have that. And that constantly must be taken to obtain that high that they have. So, so it is that the star seeks fame. They want that. It, it is an appetite that they, they have. There are selfish and there are selfless. Selfish leads one to boast. Selfish is the epitome of pride, like Satan wanting to be like God. But honestly, the selfless life leads to, the selfless person leads to life, and it leads to more reliance on the Lord. And that's where we want to be. John MacArthur states that pride motivates all other sin like the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, because it elevates self above everyone else. And I think that's, that's true because we have a, a works-based system in, in society. We want to boast in the things that we have said and done. But if you look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 about salvation, where it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. Salvation, not of yourselves. And it says beyond that, uh, so that no one can boast. We, we can't be wanting that uh, workspace and we take all the accolades because well, what's the point of Christ dying on the cross if we can boast in our own actions and our own work to do it? I, th- I think we'd rather be over in 2 Corinthians ten seventeen, where it says, but he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. That's where our boasting needs to be and what he has done on the cross and for us for salvation. Verse 17, And the world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Knowing that the world is passing away, what should our response be? How do we live? What should our response be? With an eternal perspective, looking to Eternity and a future? Yeah? What else? Whether people see our lives and see that our desires are different from the world. Amen to that. Yeah, the world should look at us. Our desires should be uh, much different. It should be focused on the Lord and what He's about. Yeah, I like that. What else? Desire should be for the lost. We should have a focus that, you know, looks at, at them and um, they need the Lord. Um, it's hard to have com- compassion on our, our leaders of the day, but I truly don't want them to go to hell. I really honestly wish that they would be saved and turn from their ways. And that's where we should be focused as well. If you turn over to Colossians chapter 3, I'll close with this. Colossians chapter 3, if you turn over there real quick. Colossians 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ... Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. You catch that? Our minds, our thoughts, our attitudes, our affections must be focused on the things from above. 
our minds. So what goes in definitely impacts us. Uh, what we read, what we listen to, um, everything that we focus on should be something hopefully that edifies us. Um, I know we all read a lot of different things that are online and those are not necessarily positive at all times, but if we keep a proper perspective on who the Lord is and what he's about and keep our minds sharp in that area, I think that's what we're talking about here. Verse um, three, for you died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. How did you die? How did you die? Self? Crucified with Christ? That's how we die, isn't it? We, we die to ourselves when we become a Christian, when we repent of our sins, when we turn from our ways and we follow after Christ. That, that's how we die to our fleshly desires um, in this world. But what did you die to? Died to self, died to lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. We died to the boastful pride of life. Those are the things that we should be dying to, um, getting rid of those. All the former things that we took pleasure in doing, you ever notice that after you got saved, sin became not as fun? All those things you thought, oh, this is wonderful. And then you come back and you, two weeks later after you're saved and you do something, and you're like, yeah, it's not fun anymore. Yes, sir. How does re repentance fit into faith alone and Christ alone? Well, in order to be saved, you obviously have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're repenting from your sins and following after him. And as a result of that, then you have these uh, attributes that we're talking about where you're dying to self because you can't die to yourself without Christ because of sin that with is within us. So after that, obviously salvation, we focus on the fruit of the Spirit, love, self-control, peace, joy, kindness. That's what we focus on uh, after salvation. Galatians 6.14, boast in the cross. <laughs> right, not boast in the, the things the world sees that we should have. Or, you know, I think that's true. We see that a lot. We don't want the world's accolades. Our hope is in a better future. Heaven isn't a place on earth, despite what Belinda Carlisle might think. You know, it, it's something that is future. Uh, verse 4 in Galatians, When Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you also will be manifested with him in glory. This is our hope, isn't it? This is why we are, are so passionate about serving the Lord. He is the reason we put so much energy into following him when we can be manifested with him when he comes back. We're going to be with him. That's an amazing uh, idea that we're going to be there with him. We must be constantly reminded of that to check our sin at the door. Verse 5, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Consider the members of our bodies as dead to these things. These lusts, these passions that draw us away from the Lord. We're to not even consider them 
alive in any way, dead to these things. For those here that don't believe, though, uh, it, it, it's the wrath of God is coming. And we can't ever lose sight of that. Anyone that follows after their own fleshly desires is not saved. Could possibly be, yeah, absolutely. Could be someone that is, you know, disbelieves and is not repentant of their sins and become a, a Christian. Could be considered a son of disobedience for sure. Our minds must be so focused on our Lord that the sin that is in us is set aside, that it doesn't dominate us in any way, that it doesn't lead us into the ways of the world. Because with, without salvation, as I mentioned, the wrath of God is coming. Those that practice these sins, to those who are drawn into the world by their own lust of the flesh, drawn by the eyes uh, into a world of darkness, and those who puff themselves up will one day be called to account for the rebellion that they have against God. It's not too late, as we talked earlier, for you to consider the gospel. Christ cares for you to come to him and reject your sin, repent, fall on your knees and say, you're the Lord. The hope of heaven is so much brighter than the darkness that is in this world and the world system. Any thoughts? I would just say to what you kind of been saying before that uh, there needs to be a distinction between uh, someone can be saved and still be in sin and still hate their flesh and still be uh, undergoing some of those desires. I think Romans 7, uh, you know, 19 to 30, whatever. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he even states that uh, it's not even me that's sinning anymore. It is the sin because God has saved me by his grace. I am the one who is pursuing good in my mind. I want to do good things, but the sin that dwells in me overtakes and I do the things that I don't want to do. Yeah. So there is that distinction between uh, someone, someone can be saved and still be undergoing those desires. But sure. The Holy Spirit is basically at war with the flesh in that instance. Yeah. I mean, that's the friction that we face is that we can still be impacted by fleshly desires even though we're saved. I mean, like you said, Paul uh, said he did, the things that he really wants to do, he doesn't do, and the things that he, you know, I can't remember the whole verse, but. Uh, Titus 15, verse 25, Paul says, Paul says, yeah. Yeah. Right. The greatest assault that Satan has does appeal to us in all three levels, body, soul, and spirit. I mean, you can see that everywhere. Cornell? <laughs> One man put it this way. He said, if you get in the if, if you get in the ring with Muhammad Ali and he's considered him dead, it's not going to go well for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't want to, to, to denigrate the translation. It's actually accurate. It's just a better translation. Is we need to be fully engaged in this thing, mortifying the sin that comes into our lives. We need to take an active role in seeking it out and destroying it using the Word of God, counsel, and accountability. Yeah. That's, that's really good. I, I think that's, that, that hits home. We need to kill sin. We need to be actively uh, destroying it in every facet of our lives. It's, it's a conscious effort. Thank you for that. Anything else? All right, let's pray. 
Father, you alone are worthy to be praised. Thank you for your love for us, for the saints. Uh, Thank you for the church. Uh, I pray for the message this morning, Lord, that you'll give Jim wisdom and and grace as he preaches. Just uh, thank you for an ability to come into a place, be edified by the saints, uh, to be encouraged and to be strengthened in, in the faith, to open up the word of God is amazing. Thank you for all that you do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.